So my trick is I'm reading my speech so I can fit it into the 20 minutes. <laughs> Don't interrupt me. <laughs> I couldn't decide whether to call this talk Confessions of a Reluctant Philanthropist or F40C's 13-year experiment with philanthropy report from year eight. F40C works hard in developing a more just, sustainable, democratic economy. Since we're talking about the economy, it means we have to talk about money, the primary medium of exchange. And that means we have to talk about finance capital, the big piles of money that are moved around to pay for land, buildings, the purchase of machines, raw material, and human labor. All for the purpose of building the infrastructure and enterprises that keep humans clothed, housed, fed, entertained, healthy, and so on. Now under capitalism, a second purpose has been deeply interwoven into the first, making more money and building up more power for those who already control the big piles of money. Next slide. The bigger pile of money. <laughs> now, if we haven't made it clear yet, we at F40C and most everybody in this room believe those big piles of money are a resource that should not be controlled by the 1% of the 1%. Rather, they should be under the democratic control of communities, invested to take care of the people and planet. It was the people's lives and labor that created the big piles of money in the first place, so it makes moral sense for the people in their communities to be the ones who control it. And it probably makes fun functional sense too. We just get more just and sustainable results if the people got to decide. I bet people in communities wouldn't just think about their immediate needs, they'd think about the needs of their children and grandchildren, even their great-grandchildren. Next slide. My grandson. <laughs> Changes everything. This talk, yeah, I used to only think for myself, you know. Um, this talk isn't going to get into how communities are go going to govern the big piles of money, and that's because we really don't know very much about that. It's not that that's not important, it's just that we don't know much about it yet. We're working on it. What I'm going to focus on is one experimental strategy we're using at F40C for beginning to move control of the big piles of money, and that experiment is philanthropy. Or maybe I should say, effing philanthropy because after doing this for eight years, I still have this ew feeling whenever I have to tell somebody what I do for my day job. I run a private foundation with Ed. I didn't set out to become a philanthropist. I had a perfectly viable career as an educational researcher and an equally committed life as a community activist. Not only did I have other career aspirations, I was and remain pretty suspicious of philanthropy as an authentic force for social change. And yet I made the choice I made for both personal and political reasons, and it's given me lots of opportunity to understand the possibilities and the limitations of philanthropy. There's a small but growing number of people and foundations that are independently and occasionally working together to try to figure out whether and how it might be possible to take our relatively small big piles of money and use them to leverage even bigger piles of money into the service of the people. And I say relatively small, even though $10 million, $25 million may seem like a lot of money. In the big scheme of the economy, what the, what the foundations have is very small. By my back of the envelope calculation, if all the foundations in the world together control less than one half of 1% of the assets that are now accumulated in the world. So even if tomorrow all of them decided, and I don't think they're about to do this, but if they all decided to move their assets under the control of the people, I assure you that capitalism would just motor on completely unconcerned about what was gonna happen next. So simply getting the philanthropic world to move its money more in line with our values just doesn't get us very far. Any big change would take much more than foundation money. It's gonna take power, and it's the same kind of power we've been talking about since we got here. It's the power of organized people and communities. It will take all our time, money, and gifts of all of us to develop a clear vision of the world that we want and get ourselves organized to bring that into being. And I see us doing that in two ways. First, demanding change so loudly and clearly and powerfully that we cannot be refused. And I think of this as the demand side. And second, by just starting to remake the world into the new world that looks the way we want. And I think of that as the do for ourselves side. At F40C, we believe that the demand has to be complemented by doing for ourselves because people need to see for themselves that a new way is possible. We have to create the existence proofs that there is another better way for communities to live and that we are exactly the people to do it. Now, providing financial resources to smart, well-organized demand and do for ourselves projects is something that philanthropy can do. 
If we bring that money to bear in smart, timely ways, it can kindle the movement and inspire escalating change. At least that's the theory that we're experimenting with right now at F4DC. We focus a tremendous amount of resource and staff time on inventing and building a new economy, an economy that works for all of us, not just a privileged few, because it's part of this existence-proof process. So here's my report on how our experiment is going. I have to start from the beginning, or how I reluctantly came to be a philanthropist. In 2007, my father, W. Hayden Thompson of Cleveland, Ohio, died at the age of 79. My dad's death was, of course, sad for me and my family, though it wasn't unexpected. He'd been ill for several years. So in addition to it being a sad occasion, it was a momentous event in the lives of his five kids, including me, because we were all set to inherit millions of dollars, enough money that none of us would ever have to work again if we chose not to. Except that I didn't. I did not inherit. In the years before my dad's death, I worked with him to make a different arrangement where all the money went to start the Fund for Democratic Communities. And I asked my longtime troublemaking friend, Ed, if he would help me figure this out. He said yes, and that is how F4DC came to be. And the name was Ed's idea, by the way. So now we're at the part where I got to tell you how F4DC's money got piled up in the first place. My dad and his old high school buddy, Bill Conway, both loved to play golf. They played golf together with, from high school until the year before my dad died. Next slide. They often talked business when they played golf together. Bill Conway wanted to buy a small company that dug sand out of the ground in Chardon, Ohio, cleaned it, and shipped it out. The company was called Best Sand. To raise money to purchase Best Sand, Bill asked my dad to join him as a minority investor. My dad liked Bill and liked the prospects for the company, so he invested and took a seat on the board of directors. Coincidentally, some of Best Sand's best customers were golf courses. They need sand to put in their sand traps. Best Sand had other customers as well, garden shops, municipal parks, recreation facilities, and foundries that use sand in the casting and mold making process. Here's another coincidence. I used to work in a foundry, and I actually know how to do sand casting. <laughs> Now, you may be wondering why I'm talking so much about sand when you thought this talk was going to be about finance capital. But hang on, sand is at the very center of this. Best Sand continued to do very well, and the single operation in Ohio grew as Bill acquired more sand and mineral companies. Best Sand grew to 22 plants in five countries, employing 800 people. Eventually, Best Sand got so big it renamed itself to reflect its new stature and breadth of operations, Fairmount Minerals. Fairmount because Bill Conway had lived on Fairmount Boulevard almost all his life. Minerals because it wasn't just sand anymore. It was also resins made from sand and other things you can dig up out of the ground. The very definition of extraction. But sand was still at the heart of it. In fact, sand became their greatest asset. Were people taking up golf in unheard of numbers? Were people putting in sandboxes in every backyard? Maybe those sectors did grow, but what really took off was a whole new use for sand, oil and gas drilling. Next slide. It turns out that as we use up the finite supply of oil and natural gas in the ground, that the price goes up, high enough to make it worth the cost of digging it out of ever more difficult to reach places and digging out grades of the stuff that were earlier considered too dirty to mess with. Turns out that you need a whole lot of sand to blast into those places and to clean the dirtier deposits. Next slide. The value of Fairmount Minerals went up, 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 so that my dad's initial investment rose in value by about 2,000%. And that's not like just gross exaggeration. That's the calculation. Eventually, my dad, by the way, never moved a, a grain of sand <laughs> in that whole process. Eventually, in 2010, my dad's Fairmount Minerals shares were purchased by an equity fund called American Securities that was looking to get more involved in the booming oil and gas business. American Securities now owns and operates Fairmount Minerals, where it goes by the new name of Fairmount Sandtrawl. I have no idea what a Sandtrawl is. So, um, next slide. If you went on to, oh, that's too bad that that's too high. It says from Fairmount Minerals 2013 mission statement. If you went on to Fairmount Minerals website in 2013, the very first line of their mission statement was prominently displayed. Fairmount Minerals helps the world produce clean drinking water and enhance natural gas production. I checked their website earlier this year, and that line is no longer there. And that's a good thing, because the reason that drinking water needs to be cleaned is because of all the dangerous stuff that gets into it in the process of drilling for natural gas. <laughs> so, yeah, right at the core of this whole thing is a contradiction so big you could drive an oil truck through it. <laughs> Fairmount is making money selling sand into the oil and gas drilling business, by which I mean fracking, 
and they're making money selling sand into the water purification business that is only needed because of all the contaminants that are released in the oil and gas drilling business. Next slide. And I note that in the conventional way of measuring economic activity, this isn't even a contradiction. It's a doubling of the bottom line. Fairmount, like many other companies, has cleverly found a way to make money on the front side and the back side of this opportunity. Never mind that the dirtying of the water is actually a negative, the way GDP is calculated and the way our economy works, it's all positive economic activity because money is being made by someone. And here's another contradiction for you. The proceeds from American Securities' purchase of the Fairmount Mineral Stock represent the lion's share of the funds that undergird F4DC and its work. F4DC at one time controlled roughly $10 million, and almost half of that came from my dad's investment in Fairmount Minerals. Next slide. We were, once, we were once accused of spending dirty steel money, and I just love telling people, no, it's dirty sand money. <laughs> now, I have to stop and say something here. It feels almost traitorous to my family and to the Conway family to expose this piece of truth. I want to say something else. We Thompsons, we are very good people, and so are the Conways and all the other people working at Fairmount Minerals. I believe this with all my heart. But I think it still is necessary to look under the hood to see what's driving the economy and the society. And we have to be honest and open about the contradictions and the part we play in sustaining them. So what does this contradiction mean for me personally? Should I have just thrown up my supposedly clean hands and said, can't touch it, it's too dirty? Or was it possible that I could attempt to use this dirty money to do something transformative? So I decided, as you know, to not throw up my hands. I decided to try to disrupt the contradiction by trying to use the money to undermine the very processes that allowed it to pile up in the first place. So every day, we F4DCers go to work spending this dirty money on building a more democratic, just, and sustainable economy. We're trying to use money made from the most extractive parts of the extractive economy to build a non-extractive economy. Now, how's that for justice or irony or something? We're a Sunset Foundation. We plan to have spent all the resources of F4DC by the end of 2020. That's about $10 million from start to end. We chose to Sunset because we think that these resources are best put to work right now. We humans are at a really critical juncture in our survival. So at F4DC, we figure we'll invest the whole schmear now in building the individual, community, and institutional capacity needed to make the turn. In other words, we're spending now on the just transition on projects like the Southern Reparations Loan Fund, a project of the Southern Grassroots Economies Project. Is Nikki here? There's Nikki. Nikki is the Southern Reparations Loan Fund first and only staff member. So essentially, we're trying to build up a pile of money that will be under the democratic control of people coming from the most marginalized communities in the South. And this pile of money will be put to work as investments and loans into productive businesses that meet human needs and elevate the quality of life in southern communities. We think we need to build up a pile of money about as big as half a billion dollars, and maybe then we could do something transformative in the South. That's a lot of money. I didn't know that when I first wrote that. Now I know how much money that is. <laughs> we name the fund the Southern Reparations Loan Fund because we are about repairing the damage done to our southern people and communities by the extractive economy. That economy is rooted in genocide, theft, the spoliation of the earth, slavery, Jim Crow, and modern day corporate exploitation. The harms done have had terrible effects on individuals, but they were done to whole communities with broad justifications that dehumanized whole groups. These were and are community harms, and they require a community response. Communities working together to figure out how to solve their own problems by creating sustainable solutions that raise the quality of life for all. Communities like Northeast Greensboro, where a crew of dedicated folks have been working for years to build the Renaissance Community Co-op Grocery Store, or RCC. And can I have Jay and Casey and Mo stand up, please? These three folks are three of the nine board members for the Renaissance Community Co-op, and they work so hard to bring this into being. So let me tell you a little bit about the story on this. Next slide. Northeast Greensboro has been a food desert since 1998 when the last grocery store, the Winn-Dixie, closed its doors. Since then, there's been no grocery store to serve the 35,000 people who live there. 
The community began organizing to recruit a grocery store as soon as the Winn-Dixie closed, but had no luck attracting a chain grocer. Not because a store wouldn't be profitable, but because the profits would be higher in more affluent parts of town. Though initially unsuccessful, and that, that is the Winn-Dixie. Though initially unsuccessful, that organizing got people connected and launched a community group that remains organized to this day. The group had to take several years off from organizing the grocery store to stop a landfill from opening in their community, a process that took 10 years of organizing and fighting. When the landfill fight ended successfully, we asked community leaders if they'd be interested in a community-owned grocery store. And after some educational field trips, the community decided that's exactly what they were going to do. Quit waiting for someone else to open a store and open it themselves. And the next slide, please. And that's some of those folks. Yeah. So go to the next slide, please. After f almost four years of organizing, I'm proud to say that early next year, the Renaissance Community Co-op Grocery Store will be open in the soon to be renovated shops at Renaissance Plaza in the footprint of the old Winn-Dixie. Next slide. This is, these are just pictures of all the years of organizing work that has gone on. Next slide. The store will be 10,000 square feet of healthy, affordable food, the kind of food this community wants. Fresh vegetables, fruits, dairy, and meats. A deli, a hot bar, and more. Projections show, uh, that are based on an independently produced market study show that the RCC will gross over $4 million per year by its third year of operations, if not sooner. The store will employ 32 people in dignified jobs paying at least $10 an hour. Full-timers will get health benefits. And this pay and benefits package is well above the grocery industry standard in North Carolina. And all of it will be community owned. The profits will stay in the community. And over the next 10 years, we estimate about $400,000 in profits will, besides paying everybody and all that, will stay in the community. It'll take about $2.1 million to open the store. And as of right now, the RCC has raised just over $2 million. So it's worth asking the question, where does a low to moderate income community get $2 million? Well, 100,000 comes right from the community. Families and individuals ponying up $100 a piece for an ownership share. Some people are buying it $5 a month for 20 months. I'm getting there. <laughs> um, oh no, you made me lose my place. All right. <laughs> Some people, you know, there's not a lot of cash in this community, but people are putting their money in to do this. Um, 650 people have paid up already, and we don't think we're going to have a problem getting to 1,000 before the store opens in April. But that's just $100,000. That's the core equity piece. We still have to go get another $2 million, and some of that is going to come from foundations and a little from the city of Greensboro in the form of grants, money that doesn't have to be paid back. But because of various legalities and other issues, no more than five or 600,000 is gonna come in the form of grants. So that means a whole bunch is gonna to have to come in the form of debt. So that means it's money that's gotta be paid back. And when you're getting the debt from conventional sources, it's that, that debt and its repayment is framed up in the, in the kinds of ways that Brendan was just talking about. It means you've got to pay it back whether you have the money or not. It means it's got to be paid back in a pretty short time frame, well, even if that time frame doesn't work for you. And if you can't pay it back, the lender gets to come and take something in collateral. So you may be worse off for having incurred the debt that you, uh, than you were when you started. Our financial projections show that we can pay a certain amount of conventional debt, but we needed access to much more patient capital. And that's what I really want to talk to you guys about now at the end. I want to explain the relationship between the working world and regenerative finance, who are, are, are connected to the grocery store project in a way that is absolutely inspiring, if you ask me. Andrew Meeker, where are you? Stand up. Andrew is a member of regenerative finance. Regenerative finance is a crew of young people with wealth who are committed to social justice and they're willing to put their money where their mouth is. The Regenerative Finance Crew has already raised $213,000 in very patient investment for the RCC and is now collecting the last pledges to bring this to a total of $230,000. All the investors have agreed to 0% interest and they are all moving their money through the working world. The working world, in turn, is then lend the, the, ag the agent that is lending the money to the RCC, and they're following their non-extractive terms. And what this means concretely is this. 
The money gets paid back only when the co-op has reached profitability and all its other debts have been repaid. In the meantime, RCC will pay a small royalty on profits to the working world equivalent to 5% of net pre-tax profit for each $100,000 invested. And since the royalty is based on profits, it means that in the lean years before the store is profitable, the RCC will owe the working world nothing. And that's a key difference between standard interest arrangements and non-extractive finance. The working world is also prepared to make all or most of this royalty payment available right back to the community as the seed capital for a locally controlled revolving loan fund, so the whole process can be repeated. Now, we're still working out the details on exactly where the RCC royalties are going to go, but most likely, these reinvested dollars are going to be repatriated, in a way, to the Southern Reparations Loan Fund. Next slide, please. And this is this crazy diagram that makes my head hurt whenever I try to explain it, but this is kind of that whole deal. We'll talk about it later if you want to get into the details. <laughs> This all shows the tight working relationship between projects like the RCC, the Southern Reparations Loan Fund, and the working world. The Southern Reparations Loan Fund is part of the peer network that the working world is kicking off this year after years of work getting it to the place where it was right to do that. We are one of the, when, when Brendan showed the map, we are one of the partners on that map uh, that, that Brendan showed. All of this is part of a not so secret plot it's a plot to develop a national network of democratically controlled loan funds which band together to build the pool of capital and all the other infrastructure needed to create the finance arm of an economy built on justice, democracy, and sustainability. And if we are successful, we are going to give Wall Street a literal run for its money, which was Brendan's point. So Wall Street's big pile of money, like F4DCs, grew from the stolen land and lives of native peoples and enslaved Africans. The stolen labor of people who essentially donated their lives, donated without being asked, and labor to form the kernels of cash that are now invested in Wall Street corporations and a whole bunch of privately held companies. So what can we do to acknowledge this history and honor the stolen lives and labor that grew those big piles of money? We need to put those piles of money to work repairing the damage. And that's why we named our effort the Southern Reparations Loan Fund. And it's why F4DC is spending its resources trying to figure out how to leverage our little bit of capital to get more capital under the control of people working together in communities. And that's the experiment that we're going to be pursuing for the next five years, and we will keep you posted about how it goes.